before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I... Oh, good morning. Welcome to Living Stones Church. So glad that you guys are joining us here this morning. Why don't we stand up, say hi to somebody, welcome them to the church. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. Hey. 
today. We fix our eyes on you, God, the author and perfecter of our faith. We give you glory among people to sing to our God this morning. There is a truth that's older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one Born for our salvation, Jesus. Here we go. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a king that forever reigns. There is freedom from the chains that bind us.
there is power oh, in your name. You're my rock and my redeemer. Yeah, there is power. Set on you, yeah. And you meet me here today. 
seeds that I knew, yeah And all my fears and doubts They can all come to you Because they can't stay long When I'm here with you It's a new horizon And I'm set on you When you meet me here today With mercies that I knew, yeah And all my fears and doubts They can all come to you Let every breath 
your voice and we sing. Yes, I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. You're my savior, my closest friend, and I will worship until the very end lift up another shout of praise to our god he's worthy to be praised jesus we love you with all of our hearts every day we ask so many questions what should i wear what's the weather going to be like how am i going to fit everything in but then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. My girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible, but the truth is none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself, you can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith and meaning. Oh, there I am. Those of you that have taken it, you're like, yes, Alpha, it's amazing. Hey, good morning. How y'all doing? Outside, how you doing? Good. Online, how you doing? Can't hear you. No, just joking. Hey, welcome to church. We're so glad to have you here with us this morning. And I'm going to let the kids go in just a moment, but I just first want to pump Alpha just a little bit more. Uh, Alpha is one of those things that we encourage every single person in our church family to go through. Invite your friends, neighbors, co-workers, those that don't know Jesus, those that have known Jesus for 50 years. It's just one of those things that it's just so, so good. And on top of that, free dinner, usually from Big Island Grill, and free child care. So my wife and I have told you this before, we call it date night every Wednesday night. It's fantastic. It's just so, so good. Uh, and you know, we'll talk about other small groups and things in just a moment, but I just want to encourage you, you know, there's a lot of things you can sign up for out at the info table today and online if you're watching. Uh, Alpha First. If you haven't taken Alpha, don't look at anything else. That is the place to go. All right, kids, you can be released to kids ministry. That's up through age 11. Also have junior high meeting out on the beach, uh, all the way to the king, kids' kingdom tent uh, as they go. A couple other things I want to bring to your attention as they're headed out. Uh, this Wednesday, 6.30, right here, we're having kind of a corporate night of prayer as part of our 21 days of uh, prayer and fasting. How's it all going? You guys doing okay? 
One week left, praise God. I can't wait to stand next Sunday and be like, it's over, guys. It's, it's been so good, but eating so good too, amen? amen? Amen. God gave us food to enjoy. Praise God. But uh, this Wednesday, 6.30 here, we're just having a time, just kind of directed corporate prayer. Really looking forward to that. Also, this Friday, the 13th, uh, also here, we're going to have a night of worship, our Wonder Night of Worship, 6.30, another kind of corporate gathering as part of these 21 days of prayer and fasting. If you've kind of clued in, our first one was Declare the Word Night, second one this Wednesday will be prayer, third one this Friday will be worship. It's three key components to our prayer life, the Word, worship, and, and, uh, and prayer, actually speaking to God. So we're very excited about these things. Other thing I want to bring to your attention is we still have some slots open in our small groups. If you have not signed up for a small group and you've already taken Alpha, do you see how I did that? Connect those right there? Okay. Uh, then we encourage you, go find a group outside. Now, I've only told this to Pine Trees. I don't know if Bill shared this with you, but I'm going to let you in on the secret. If you're wanting to secure your spot in a group before it fills up, don't sign up on paper, sign up online. When you sign up on paper, there's a slight delay because those get taken today and then inputted and somebody could beat you to the punch by getting on our app or getting on our website. Now, paper's fine. It'll get the job done, hopefully, okay? But if you really want to get the group that you want, get online, our website, or through our app and pick your group. We are absolutely committed to small groups. How many of y'all know that you were not created to do life alone? You will be eaten alive by the enemy if you do life alone. First Peter 5.8. Enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's those of you that are not in small groups that he's looking after, okay? <laughs> Truly, it's just such a place of, of growing together, of fellowshipping, of praying together. And these small groups are very focused on application of the word, application of the message. This is how do we do life together? How do we put into practice and encourage each other and challenge each other uh, in our uh, walk as, as followers of Jesus? So cannot uh, uh, encourage you enough with that. The other thing I just want to highlight that you'll also see out there as one of the small groups is the freedom course. This is something that after you've taken Alpha, we highly encourage people to do. We're launching it as an eight-week uh, course beginning uh, next Monday. Not this coming one, but the one after that. And it's not something like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm addicted or I'm, you know, demon possession. It's not that. This is something that's for truly everyone. Because how many of y'all know that you are less free today than you could be tomorrow? And that Christ came, we're told, is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So that's another one that you can look at. Again, check those out. Sign up for one. And we made it through announcements. Praise God. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you so much, Holy Spirit, that you administer the Father's love to us so well. That you're speaking to us through your presence, Lord. We're just so grateful. And Lord, as we come to look at your word this morning, and, and just to talk about hearing your voice more clearly, um, would you come and speak? Would you come and take the word of God Lord, and, and would you light it on fire in, in, in our hearts this morning? Lord, we, we declare that your word is true, that it holds all authority in our lives, Lord. And we just come this morning and we, we just want to get low. We want to step under the authority of your word. We step under the authority of Jesus right now and we say you are in charge of our lives and we're just excited to see what you want to speak to us this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. Okay, I want to begin with a question, and, and I just need to let you know, I, I'm preaching a sermon, uh, most of which I preached a couple few weeks ago at Pine Trees, and, and I wasn't going to do it, but I felt like the Lord said, no, we need to do it again here as well, and we're going to be looking at this whole idea of uh, hearing God's voice in a personal way, more accurately learning to recognize God's voice. And, and I want to begin with the question is this, can you remember, if you've had this moment, can you remember the first time that you heard God speak to you? Can you remember that moment where you kind of finally figured out or, or recognized, oh, that was God that was speaking to me? I remember, this would have been eight years ago now, one of my daughters, Haley, I was putting her to bed. She was up on her bunk bed, and I got done praying with her and said, amen, lights out, you know, good night. And she turned to me and she crossed her arms and she just kind of twisted up her face like this. She said, I'm mad. I was like, I can tell you're mad. 
Why are you mad? I don't hear God the way you and mommy hear God. Now, she's like the queen of sass, and so she just, she can really put it on. And she was just so upset. I was like, what do you mean? I never hear, you and mommy hear God. I never hear God the way you and mommy hear God. And I just said, would you like to? Yes. Still kind of, you know, full of grump, grumpiness and angst. And, and I said, well, here, here's what we're going to do. I want you to close your eyes. And we're just simply going to ask God a question that you already know the answer to. What do you mean? Just, just hold this. Just trust me on this one. Okay. So I said, Haley, I want you to pray, Father, do you love me? And then just listen to what he says. So I said, Father, do you love me? And then her whole, whole demeanor changed. And she got the biggest smile on her face. But honestly, it wasn't her, her, her mouth so much. It was her eyes. I don't know if you've ever seen that on somebody's face where it looks like their eyes are just smiling right at you. And I said, what did he say? He said, yes, daddy. He said, yes. And it was this moment of realization that I really believe for her kind of kick-started her relationship with the Lord. It was that moment of just recognizing, hey, God's been speaking to me. I just never knew which one was his voice. And I think a lot of it is the same for us. You know, we talk about, okay, learning to hear God's voice. I want to suggest that most of you, if not all of you, are already hearing God's voice. You just haven't learned to distinguish which voice is his. Because how many of y'all know there's a multiplicity of voices speaking at us all the time? You've got your own voice, your own thoughts, your own insecurity, your own arrogance and pride, your own fears and shames and worries and condemnation. You got the voice of the world, you got the distractions of TV and pressures from work. You got all these voices that are speaking at you, and somewhere in the mix of those voices is the voice of your heavenly Father. And it's not that you're not hearing it, you just can't quite Oh, there it is. You haven't been able to maybe necessarily recognize this is the voice of my Father. And that's what I really want to look at this morning. Because there really is a difference between hearing and actually recognizing that it is the voice of our Heavenly Father. In a lot of ways, it's a lot like learning a new language. You know, I could have someone come and speak Korean to me. I'm hearing it, but I'm sure not understanding what it's being spoken, right? I'm not recognizing the words. In a lot of, it's the same way with our Heavenly Father. He's speaking to us, and we grow in our ability to actually recognize when it's him speaking and what he's actually speaking to us. And I feel like this is very important as we're kind of coming through this last week of our 21 days of prayer and fasting, that we spend some time getting better at hearing his voice. Really important. How many of all have ever been bored praying before? Okay? Those of you that haven't, you're lying, and that's okay. That's a different sermon. But... I'd like to suggest to you that maybe one of the reasons that you're bored in prayer is that you're talking too much. <clears throat> because us talking to God is the boring part of prayer. Him talking to us is the exciting part of prayer. Uh, I think I've shared this story with some of you before, but earlier this year I got the chance to go to uh, Peru with Compassion International, and they took us up to Machu Picchu. And I'm standing in the largest temple up there on, in, in the Andes Mountain, and I was really struggling because, you know, I got the tour guide, and he's saying, look at how this ink can put this rock on this rock and all this stuff. And I'm just completely unimpressed. I'm standing in one of the seven wonders of the world, completely disengaged. It's not hitting me. And I start praying. I was like, Lord, what's the matter with me? I should be more excited. I should be more impressed with what I'm seeing right now, but I'm just not. And I felt like the Lord spoke, and it was just like this realization downloaded to me in a moment. And, and I had this understanding. I was like, wow, Lord. What I'm looking at right now does not come even close to comparing to hearing you speak five words to me. What I'm looking at right now doesn't even come close to 30 seconds in your presence. And it was just, it put everything in perspective. Because when we hear God speak to us, I love you, that changes, that marks you for life. You cannot have that experience and not be changed, right? Right? And so what we want to look at today is really something I think is absolutely essential to our walk after Christ. Some of us think of it as just ancillary. It's not. That hearing God and learning to hear Him and recognize His voice in that personal way is absolutely essential to what it means to be a follower of Christ. Why? Because that's how Christ lived every day of His life. And He told us to teach everyone everything that He taught us 
And he's taught us how to hear and recognize the voice of his father. So what we're going to do today is just look at some simple things that we can do, some approaches we can take to learn how to recognize the voice of our heavenly father better. And here's the first one, and I think the foundational, most important one, it's this. When we're talking about hearing God's voice, number one, you've got to always approach it with humility. Everyone say humility. 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 That means you're going to get it right sometimes. And guess what? For you perfectionists, you're going to get it wrong sometimes. Nobody hears God perfectly. If you ever find someone that says that they hear perfectly every time, plug your ears, don't take a single word from them. Because they don't. That's why we're commanded. Paul tells the church, he says, you've got to judge, you've got to weigh every prophetic word that you receive. Because sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong wrong. Now, I think a couple weeks ago, Bill actually looked at this story, but it's so good, I'm going to do it again. There's a story in Matthew chapter 16, where Peter has kind of one of those high moments in his pre-being filled with the Holy Spirit existence, okay? You know, there's a stark difference between the disciples in in the Gospels and the disciples in Acts. The difference was the Holy Spirit, right? So this is pre-Holy Spirit for for Peter, and he hasn't had, you know, very many high good moments yet, But he has this moment. Jesus is asking his disciples, hey, who do people say I am? And they give this answer and that answer. And then he looks at him and says, but who do you say I am? And honestly, this is a question that each and every one of us have to answer for ourselves at some point. We got to come before God and say, this is who I believe your son is. Either he is who you say he is, the Savior, the Messiah, the one who died in my place, or he's not. Either I'm going to accept him or I'm going to reject him. So he looks at the disciples and he says, well, who do you say I am? And Peter has his shiny moments. He looks at Jesus and he says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says, you're absolutely right. Now look how Jesus responds. This is so good. Verse 15. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now look at what Jesus said. This is really important. He's teaching us about hearing God's voice. He says, Peter, you got it right. And you can almost see Peter's chest puff up a little bit. He's standing a little bit taller as his confidence starts flooding in to his his ego at this point. And, And Jesus says, you got it right. You didn't hear this from humans. This was your father speaking to you, and you nailed it. Now, just a moment later, Jesus begins to prepare his disciples for his death and departure. He says, boys, we're headed to Jerusalem. Once we get there, they're going to arrest me, they're going to beat me, they're going to kill me. I'm going to die. And then Peter, now a little bit more confident in his ability to hear God, at least as he thinks, comes with this new boldness and he comes and it's almost like you can see him like almost like you know imagine grabbing Jesus by the collar and he says never Lord and we're told that he begins to rebuke God can we all agree that's probably not a good idea (laughs) he rebukes us we probably don't rebuke him look at how Jesus responds this time verse 23 Jesus turned to Peter and said get away from me Satan There goes his ego. (laughs) You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things. Now, now, this is so important. You are seeing things from merely a human point of view, not from God's. He said, Peter, you heard right five minutes ago, but man, did you miss it this time. You heard God the first time. It wasn't from humans. Now this is purely your insecurity. This is purely your arrogance. This is purely your desires. You're seeing things from your point of view, not from God's. You heard wrong. (laughs) Now, if Peter could hear right sometimes and wrong others, I think we can hear right sometimes, and we can hear wrong other times as well. And so we're talking about this idea of learning how to, to new, you know, learn a new language, to recognize the voice of our Heavenly Father. It's always got to be with humility. Honestly, this is something that we learn by trial and error, by practice. And we're going to look at, in just a moment, some of the safeties that God has put in place so that we don't hurt people and don't destroy ourselves as we're learning how to hear God's voice. And those are very important. We'll look at them in just a moment. But we've got to approach this thing with humility. We've got to, honestly, for some of us, we've got to get over this idea that I have to get it right every time, and we've just got to start having some fun. Right we've got to just start having some fun as we're exploring, hey, what could this look like? to grow my ability to recognize when you're speaking, not just the other voices, but when you're speaking to me, Heavenly Father. Part of this humility 
really more than anything is being grounded, living in, breathing completely 24-7 the gospel. It's coming to this place where you're saying, look, whether I hear right or wrong does not change one, just even millimeter, how much my father loves me. Whether I hear right or wrong doesn't even change whether he likes me or not. Jesus Christ took care of that 2,000 years ago on the cross. We're living from the victory that he won for us, right? We're not trying to strive after it. We're not saying, okay, I got to get better at hearing your voice so you like me better. I got to get better at hearing your voice so that, so that you can, you know, promote me into greater things. No, it's none of that. It, we're really relieving the pressure on us and saying, Jesus, you want to speak to me. You told me in John 10, your sheep hear your voice. I want to learn in this. But the pressure's more on him to speak and less on us to hear. I think part of what this does for us is it actually brings us to a place where we become more confident in his ability to speak than our ability to hear. And that's a fun place to be. To know that your father absolutely desires to speak to you and he's really good at it. Amen? It begins with humility. Everybody say humility. humility. Everyone say, I'm great at being humble. Here's the second thing. It begins with humility, and then secondly, when we're learning to recognize God's voice better, we've got to come to a place where we absolutely love the written word of God. We have to love the written word of God. You know this verse, but I want to read it to us anyway. 2 Timothy 3.16. Paul speaking to his protege, Timothy. He's like, you know, he's wrote him a couple letters. He said, here's the things you need to know to be a leader to be a follower of Christ. These are the important things. And one of them was this. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And I love the second part of this verse. He says, so that. Okay? He's saying, look, you've got to have a confidence in the written word of God, a love for the written word of God. Understand that it came straight from the mouth of God. God breathed. And, but there's a purpose behind it. He says, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, there's an implication here. If you're doing a good work that's not based upon what God has spoken to you, it's not as good as you think it is. Right? How many of y'all know that we can do a lot of good things that we think are good ideas, but they're not God ideas? Those things take a lot of our striving, take a lot of our energy, because if we begin them, you know, begin them, then the onus is on us to sustain them. But if it's a God work, Jesus says, he who began a good work in us will see it to completion, right? And there's a distinguishing thing. It's so important that we know the word of God, love the word of God, and hear what the Father's speaking to us. And so we know that when we're talking about learning to recognize his voice, it all begins and ends with the written word of God. Now there's three theological uh, descriptor words that I want to give us this morning just to kind of set the stage of what we're talking about when we're approaching the word of God. The first is inerrant, the second is authoritative, and the first is actually two, but I like more words than less, and it's that it's finished and it's complete. Now what do I mean by inerrant? It means that the word of God is completely trustworthy. You can trust it from the table of contents to the maps. You can trust the word of God. Inerrant means that there's no mistakes in it, that what we hold is exactly what God intends for us to hold. That his word was spoken, it was written down, we have it, okay? It's inerrant. But secondly, it's authoritative. That means that it speaks to all areas of our lives and holds authority over all areas of our lives. Now this should be comforting to us, but a little scary as well. Comforting in the sense that God has an answer to every problem that we have, every question that we have. He's got the answer. His word speaks to every situation. But it also means that there's no areas of our lives that we we can pick and choose and say, well, this one's under the authority of your word, but this one I'm hanging on to, right? You can have my money, God, but you sure can't have my sex life. The word of God is authoritative to speak to every area of our life. And the third one is that it's finished and complete. That means there's there's no adding to it, there's no subtracting from it. That what we hold is exactly what God meant for us to have. That means books like the Book of Mormon, the Quran, that initially were based upon the written word of God, the finished word of God, they're not God's word. They're lies, they're deception. 
because God's word, we're told, is finished and complete. And as we're learning to recognize God's voice, man, we've got to develop inside of us this absolute love, this relationship with the written word of God. When Moses had finished leading Israel uh, out, of the, uh, out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, they're in the wilderness, you know, the whole story. Moses eventually dies, and before he does, he hands over the reins to Joshua. Now, Joshua is doing something even greater. He's just not leading them out of slavery. He's leading the people of Israel into the promised land. He's leading them to what, God, you know, what was God's design all along. And he's standing on this side of the Jordan, getting ready. And God speaks to him before he goes. And look what God says to him, Joshua 1.8. He says, keep this book of the law, the word of God, the written word of God. Keep it always on your lips. Meditate. Literally, it's the picture of chewing on it over and over and over and over and over again. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, then and only then, when we hear the word and when we apply the word, join a small group, <clears throat> like that plug, then you will be prosperous and successful. God says, look, you can't do what I want you to do unless you hold tightly to the word of God. There's another story. You guys like reading the, the story of David's mighty men? Oh, love those stories. My boy's like, wait, he killed how many guys? You know, it's incredible. There's, there's one of David's mighty men, a guy named Eleazar. Incredible, incredible warrior and a man of God. And there's this one particular story where he's guarding a field. I think it was barley, flax. I can't remember what the grain was, but he's guarding this field. And, and the army of Israel is with him. And a Philistine army comes and approaches. And there's going to be a battle. And as the Philistines approach, the whole Israelite army leaves except for Eleazar. And he's just standing there with the sword, kind of looking like, what are you guys doing? And, and the army's expecting him to flee too. He's like, I'm not running. This is my field. I'm not giving it up. And he defeats the entire Philistine army single-handedly. But we're told in that story that after the battle, he returns to the Israelite camp and he can't let go of the hilt of the sword. He had clung to his sword so tightly and used it so effectively that his hand had actually frozen, had actually frozen to the hilt of that sword. Now, we're told in Ephesians chapter 6 that the Word of God is actually what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's a picture for us of what our relationship needs to be like with the Word, that we're holding on to it so tightly. We love it. We read it. We meditate on it. We make sure we're not just learning it, but we're doing it and applying it, that we have this relationship with the written Word of God. Now, there's this interesting interplay, <clears throat> excuse me, between the written word of God and the spirit of God. And we saw it already just a little bit in 2 Timothy 3. It says that all scripture is God-breathed. That word breathed in the Greek, you probably know, or some of you do, is, is the word pneuma. It means breath, can mean wind, or it means spirit. That it was actually the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God, straight out of God's mouth, that brought to us God's word. Now what happens for some of us is that we think that God breathed the word, the Holy Spirit was involved in transmitting the word to us, but then once we're here, all we need is us to receive it. It's kind of like, you guys know right now, there are all sorts of waves going through this place, right? We've got a Netflix wave, we've got a FM AM wave, we've got high definition TV, you know, uh, microwaves and different things like that that are going through here. Now, hopefully none of you are picking up those waves right now. I see you on your phone, right, watching Netflix. But they're here. Now, there's a transmitter that sends those, those, those uh, frequencies, those waves, but you can't receive them unless you've got a receiver, right? And we've heard this illustration before, but this is what I want to say. Some of us think that we, the Holy Spirit was the transmitter and that we're the receiver. No, 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 no. You can't receive the Word of God unless you have the Holy Spirit simultaneously. He is the transmitter and the receiver. Yeah. There's this interplay between the Word of God and the Spirit of God, and we need both. Jesus speaks to this. It was really interesting. I, I, I had coffee this week with two Hasidic Jews from Brooklyn. Somehow, some of you, one of you gave them my number because they went into a jewelry shop. I love this. They're trying to meet with all the Jews here in Hawaii. So they came and they're like, we're looking for Jews. Where are we going to go? Let's go to a jewelry shop, of course. So I just love it. I'm 59% Jewish. I was great. I get it, right? 
Anyway, somebody gave him my number and we meet with them and we just have the best talk, the best discussion about all things Old Testament. I'm just picking their brain and we're talking about all sorts of passages, having an amazing time. But their eyes are completely blinded to the truth of God's word. I mean, I could go into the details. Completely blinded. Why? Because they believe that the Holy Spirit gave the word of God, but they don't have the Holy Spirit to receive the word of God. Jesus said the same thing about the Pharisees. He said, you have the word of God. You know it better than anybody, but it's done you no good. Because if it had done you good, you would have recognized that they're talking about me. There's this interplay between the spirit of God and the word of God. And part of what the Holy Spirit does, he does a lot of things, but part of what the Holy Spirit does is he actually shows us how to implement the word of God. Uh, For example, how many of you all agree that the word of God tells us that we're to love our neighbors? Right? You can Google it. You'll find it in there. But does the word of God tell me how to love my neighbor who I hate because he's an idiot Thursday morning at 8 o'clock? That's not really true with my neighbors. I got great neighbors. Except for one. No. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit takes the principles, the value, what God has written in his word and actually brings it into specific application in our lives. It's the Spirit of God that says, hey, the Word of God says that you need to love your neighbor, and here's exactly how you're going to do it this morning, right? But not only that, the Holy Spirit actually empowers us to apply and obey the Word of God. In Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning in verse 26, I believe it is, God is prophesying 600 years, something like that, before Christ came, of what was going to happen when Jesus showed up on the scene. And he said, look, I'm going to take out your heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to give you a new spirit. This is 2 Corinthians 5.17 kind of stuff. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And then he goes on in verse 27, and he says, and I'm going to put my spirit inside of you. And once my spirit is inside of you, he says, I'm going to actually cause you to walk in and obey all of my commandments. I hear whispering. Did I get the verses right? Yes. Now, here's the thing. Look at what God just said. He said, once my spirit is inside of you, not just as the transmitter, but as the receiver, you're going to know how to implement the word of God, and you're also going to be empowered to obey the word of God. How many of you are tired of trying to obey God's word and just failing and failing and failing and failing? Like, I'm not going to raise my hand. I don't want anybody to know I'm a failure. That's okay. <laughs> We're family. We love each other. I want to suggest to you, maybe it's because you're trying to do it in your own strength and not the strength of the Holy Spirit. You don't need more of you. You don't need more discipline. You need more of the Holy Spirit that empowers your disciplines. Okay? This is part of what the Holy Spirit does with the Word of God. I was reading a book by Paul Miller called The Praying Life, and he says it like this. The Word provides the structure, the vocabulary. The Spirit personalizes it to our life. I love that. I just want to do a quick exchange between what the Word does and the Spirit does. The Word of God is eternal and unchanging. It's finished and it's complete, right? But the Spirit actually gives directions that are temporary and that are changing. One day the Holy Spirit's going to tell you to speak. The next day he's going to tell you to shut up, right? The Word of God gives promises. Oh, we love the promises of God here. Over 7,000 of them written down. But it's the Holy Spirit that actually compels us and prompts us to take risks upon those promises of God. The Word of God outlines the mission we all have. Matthew 28, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always. It's the same mission that every Christian, excuse me, every Christian has. But it's the Holy Spirit that actually gives you and you and you and you and me a personal vision of how we're going to fulfill that mission. I'm going to fulfill it differently than you're going to fulfill it differently than you're going to fulfill it because we all have different jobs in the kingdom. We all got different things, different gifts. That comes from the Holy Spirit. He's the one that points those out and encourages those things in us. The Word of God describes God's character, that He is all-knowing, all-loving, full of mercy and compassion, that He is righteous and just, that He's our judge. 
but it's the Holy Spirit of God that actually draws us into, pulls us into God's emotions. It's a spirit of God that takes us not just from knowing up here that God loves me, but hearing the voice of my Father say, I love you. That actually pulls us into the experience of his love, his mercy, his compassion, his justice, his righteousness. You can't have one without the other. They so go together. And when it comes to learning how to recognize God's voice, it all begins with the written word. But it's studying the word in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Give me a bigger amen. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. Here's the third thing that I, I found personally very helpful in learning to recognize the voice of my Heavenly Father, and it's this. Number three, you gotta sensitize yourself to His presence. You gotta sensitize yourself to His presence. I guarantee you, 100% money back guarantee, that you will never hear God speak apart from his presence. What do I mean? Wherever you hear him, he's there too. In John chapter one, verse one, it says, in in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? Jesus, the logos, the word, incarnate. He is the word. Wherever you hear the word, he's there with it, if it is truly from God. Now this is significant to us because one of the ways we can grow in recognizing when it's God's voice amongst the multiplicity of voices that we hear every day is beginning to recognize his presence. It's one of the reasons that I just love these moments of of singing together, of praising and exalting Jesus. Because it's these moments when, when we come together and we begin to just sense God's presence together. I remember one of my kids, I can't I can't give away which one it was, but One of my kids was sitting with my wife uh, on the front row during a worship service years ago. And and this child just began weeping, just buried their their head in in my wife's lap. And my wife automatically goes into mom mode. She's like, are you okay? Did you get stung by a bee? Did you, you know, bite your cheek? What happened? And and my kid looked up at her and just said, nothing's wrong. I I don't know what it is. I just, I'm happy, but I just, I just feel like, God's presence right now and they were just weeping because that's one of the ways that their little body responds to the presence of God and funny enough that's how their daddy does too (laughs) you may not know this but your bodies were actually created to react to respond to the presence of God it's one of the reasons that Adam and Eve loved so dearly to walk with God in the cool of the day in the garden It wasn't just good conversation, although probably was the best conversation ever. There were feelings that was associated with it because they were created. Not just their spirits and their minds and and their souls, but their bodies, our bodies were created to be in the presence of our Heavenly Father. That's why when we die and go to heaven and the ultimate culmination when Christ returns, guess what? You get a new body, not just spirit. Some of you are like, yes, Jesus, praise God. I'm ready to turn this one in and get my new one. Yes. I get it. Man, I hit my mid-30s. I'm like, things are a lot more difficult than yeah, they used to be. 40s, just, I know some of you guys are saying, just wait, I get it. I understand. But we, our bodies actually begin to react and respond when we're in the presence of God. And I'm not talking about his omnipresence. And you're like, well, God's everywhere. Yes, but Jesus looked at his disciples one day and he said, hey, where two or more of you gather in my name, I'm there too. It's not like he wasn't there. He's God. But he says, I come in a special, tangible way that you're actually going to begin to sense. And things are going to happen when I show up that way. We can begin to actually sensitize ourselves to his presence. You know, there's a story of Jesus and he's on uh, 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 um, a ruler comes to him and says, hey, I need you to come heal my daughter. And he says, great, I'm coming with you. And he's going to heal, heal her. But along the route, there are people just swarming Jesus, right? He's trying to make his way there, but everyone's just pushing around him, trying to get, get a glimpse, trying to get a touch. They've heard the stories of the miracles, of the food multiplying. Some are there just waiting for him to say something else heretical. I mean, all these people have different reasons for being there, but there's crowds, and you've got kind of the disciples trying to be like the secret service and keeping everybody away, but they're not doing a great job. 
and Jesus walks, and there's all these people moving, and it's just like very difficult, and then he stops, and he looks at his disciples, and he says, who touched me? And you can almost envision like Peter or John going, who touched you? Are you insane? Everybody's touching you. And it's like, they're, I'm sure they were thinking, is this another one of those trick questions like the feeding of the 5,000? Like, are we supposed to have this answer that we just don't know about? And they look at Jesus and they're like, everybody's touching you. How can you ask who touched me? He said, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me. Do you remember what he said? Because I perceived power went forth from my body. Right? And here's the thing. I love this. Jesus was so aware on a moment-by-moment basis of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in his life that he could tell the moment, even in the midst of that crowd and the pushing and the shoving and all the noise and the animals, all, even in that moment, he could sense when the presence and the power of God had just touched somebody else. Now, we know the story. The disciples didn't at that point, but we know that there was a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years that pushed her way through the crowd, got close enough to Jesus, couldn't quite grab him, but gets on tiptoe, just reaches out, and oh, got the hem of his garment, immediately healed. Now, it wasn't like Jesus goes, oh, I just felt the power leave me. Like there became a deficiency in his sense of God's presence and power. No, no, no. He's so in tune with the presence of God, he says, somebody just got touched. Who is it? I want to identify who just got touched by the Lord because I'm so in tune with his presence. Now, why is that important? Because Jesus also made statements like this. Look, I only say the things that my heavenly father is saying. Not the things that he spoke, meaning quoting scripture, like this is what he's saying right now. And I only do the things that I see my heavenly father doing. How did he know what his father was saying and doing? In part, it's because he was so in tune with his father's presence. Oftentimes, when we talk about recognizing God's voice or hearing God's voice or Jesus recognizing the voice of his father, what we're really talking about is that still small voice, that nudge, that little bit of unction, right? That still small voice. We hear the story in, I think it's 1 Kings 18 or 2 Kings 18 with Elijah up on the mountain. It's that still small voice of just our Heavenly Father almost whispering to us, that nudge, that unction. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm speaking. That's oftentimes what Jesus was experiencing when he said, I'm saying what I'm hearing my Father say. Now, what is that still small voice? Because, you, you know, if someone comes up to you, they give you a prophetic word. Usually it's from that still small voice. Like, what is that? Still small voice is the combination of two things biblically. Number one, it's your thoughts. Coupled with an awareness of God's presence. What do I mean? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, again, Paul is instructing a church. And look at what he says. He says, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who can actually know what God's speaking? Who can hear what God is saying? Who can actually recognize when it's God speaking? Who can know his thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? He says, but we understand him. You mean we get to know what God is speaking? Yes. He says, we understand these things. Why? For we have the mind of Christ. When we give our lives to Jesus, we get salvation. But part of what happens as well is our minds begin to be renewed with his thinking, his thoughts, with the written word of God, but also him speaking in a personal way to us. He says we actually have now the mind of Christ. What does that mean? It means we get to know what's on God's heart, what he's thinking. What does that mean practically? It means that more thoughts than you think that are going through your head are actually God's thoughts and not yours. You ever had that experience where you have a thought and you go, man, that is way too good for me to have come up with, right? Like me picking my wife. I'm like, there's no way I could have come up with that on my own. That was totally God. She's way too good for me. You have these moments, right? That's the mind of Christ at work. But how many also know that every thought you think is not a God thought? Amen? Yeah. You're like, oh man, I don't want anybody to know all the things that I'm thinking. (laughs) But some of them are. Well, how do we know which ones are? Typically, it's the ones, and this isn't the only criteria we're going to look at, but typically, it's the ones that are associated with a clear sense of God's presence. That's why it's so important for us during these times of corporate worship, corporate prayer. You know, maybe you're on a mountain by yourself. You're hiking up, you know, uh, Mauna Kea. I don't know what you're doing, but those moments where you just have this tangible sense of God's presence. One of the things you need to be doing is 
making a mental note. What did it feel like? What was it like? How do I respond when I'm recognizing that, hey, God is here in a special way right now? Because what happens is, is once that happens again, and you've got these thoughts going in your mind, you can say, hey, maybe just maybe this is God speaking. Maybe just maybe this is the still, small voice. You know, you'll have, you, you guys have seen it, but we'll have our ministry team up at the end, and sometimes they'll give up, get up and give a prophetic word, or someone will give what Scripture calls a word of knowledge, where they're calling out something specific. I mean, it happened not too long ago. We were at Pine Trees, and, and um, I, I had a word about a lady that had um, specific back pain, and I knew exactly where it was, that there were spasms, I knew which direction the spasms were going, and I felt like the Lord said she's got brown hair and green eyes. Now, I didn't want to say it, because once you get that specific, you can really look like an idiot, but I was like, okay, I'm just going to try, take a risk. I said, this is who you are, this is what's happening, you got, you know, brown hair and green eyes. Boom, shot up, it's me! Got prayed for, healed. How does that happen? It's just thoughts sensations with a clear sense of the presence of God in that moment. And so we need to begin to just to sensitize ourselves to the presence of God. Now I want to speak to this really carefully and clearly because I always get asked, well Ryan, even if I have a clear sense of God's presence, how do I know that I know that I know that it's actually God speaking and I'm not just hearing something that's wonky? Uh, to answer that question, I think let's start by just recognizing that when we're trying to hear God's voice and recognize his voice, there's really three options that we have. Either we're hearing his voice, which is what we want, or we're hearing our voice, or we're hearing demonic voices, right? God speaks, but sometimes it's just my thoughts, it's my shame, it's my guilt, it's my great ideas. But there's also plenty of biblical accounts and records, and also you just go look on the streets of Kona and you'll see it where demonic voices are speaking as well. Now, we can hear all three of those. Part of growing and maturing in the Lord is learning which one is which. And when I'm hearing which one, how do we know? Two helpful criteria. First one is this. Whatever you just heard, does it line up with the written word of God? Does it line up with the written word of God? Now, some of you may be saying, well, look, I, I'm new to this whole thing. I'm still learning the Word of God. I know a couple of verses. I got John 3.16 down pretty good, but I, I haven't read through the entirety of Scripture yet, and I'm still new to this. How, how can I judge whether the Word that I think I heard is actually accurate and lines up with Scripture? Join a small group. I'm serious. That's why God gave us the body of Christ. That's why God gave us brothers and sisters. There are so many times where I think I heard God speak something. I'm like, I think it lines up with the word, but I'll still take it to brothers and sisters to have them judge it as well. When my wife and I uh, adopted our adult daughter, we adopted her when she was 18, we, we, you know, we had a history, a track record of hearing the Lord pretty accurately, and we felt like he was speaking. And we were talking and praying together for weeks, like, is this really from the Lord? We're looking at scripture going, I know God loves adoption. He has a heart for the widows and the orphans. This seems to line up with the word. But we still took it to trusted mothers and fathers in the faith and said, this is what we think we're hearing. Does this line up with the word of God? Do you think this is what God is saying? Confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. That's when we adopted we're always taking it to other people and saying, hey, does this line up with the written word of God? But here's the second thing, and this is so helpful, and it's helped me so much. The second question you have to ask yourself after you've, you've established that it does line up with, with the written word of God is, does it bring hope or does it bring discouragement, fear, and despair? Every encounter that we have when the Lord's speaking always leaves us feeling hope-filled. Now, this can be a gnarly experience of tears, of, of discipline, uh, of hard truths being spoken, but in the end, God's always going to bring us back to a place of hope. The enemy never brings us to a place of hope. There's this incredible story in John chapter 4 where Jesus meets up with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, right? Right? And he has this conversation with her and essentially says, you're a loose woman, you should probably change. Has this long conversation, speaks very harsh, uh, uh, difficult truths to this woman that he's never met before. And guess what? She leaves feeling loved. She leaves feeling full of hope. She runs back to the village and says, you've got to meet this guy that, that called me 
names that I shouldn't repeat, right? That said these things about my life. He's amazing. You got to come meet him too. Now, how many of y'all know that in this woman's life, there were probably other days where she was sitting at that well at noon at the hottest part of the day. She had to go there because no one liked her. Everyone knew her story, knew what kind of woman she was. She was an outcast. How many of you know there was probably days where she was hearing somebody else speak the exact same thing, but it was the enemy and not Jesus? You've had five husbands and the one you're living with right now isn't even your husband. You need to change. And then condemnation discouragement, despair, and fear come in. Now, the same things were said, essentially. But one came from God, one came from the enemy. One was God's voice, one was a demonic voice. How could you tell which was which? What did it lead to? Hope? Or did it lead to fear and despair? Right? We're told in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, about prophecy, and it says, Essentially, every, the purpose of, of hearing a word from somebody else, from God, says every prophecy is to bring about uh, encouragement, comfort, and exhortation. And so if it's not bringing about those things, then it's not an accurate prophecy. We're told elsewhere in Scripture that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a sound mind. That means every time you leave God's presence and, and He's spoken to you, you're going to leave feeling loved. And if you don't, then you heard wrong or you interpreted it wrong. Am I making sense? And so we can judge the words that we're hearing and we're commanded to judge them, right? John tells us that in 1 John. He says, don't, don't believe everything you hear. You gotta judge the spirits. You gotta test them. You gotta know where this is coming from. And so we can judge these things and I believe we can actually judge them accurately if we cling to the written word of God and having clung to the word, knowing what it says, determine whether this word is leading us into hope or whether it's leading us in to despair. I'm going to end with this, because we're out of time. If I could encourage you to do one thing this week, this final week of the 21 days of prayer and fasting, I would encourage you to experiment with hearing the Lord's voice. And specifically, you've heard us say this over and over again, specifically getting a piece of paper, getting a pen, sitting down saying, Jesus, I want to hear you speak, and then writing down everything that comes to your mind. And I guarantee you what's going to happen. You're going to be writing and you're going to go, this is stupid, this is not God. Because it's happened to me over and over and over again. But I get through it and then I go and reread it. Does it line up with scripture? Actually, this one does line up with scripture. A sense of presence, a sense of hope comes. And I go, I think maybe, just maybe, this was actually God speaking to me. And it's so important that we write it down. Because many of the things that God's going to be speaking to you, especially in this season of prayer and fasting, are words that are not for this season, but for the season God's bringing you into. And we need to have a written account. Habakkuk talks about this. Write down the revelation. Right? He says, because they're for a time to come. Take that. Take the time just to write what do you think the Lord is speaking to you and see what he does. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. It's amazing. God, we thank you that prayer is exciting, especially when we're hearing you speak to us, Lord. And Father, my, my desire, my heart this morning for all of us is that we enter this week having greater clarity, that we enter this week having a greater desire, Lord, for your presence, a greater awareness of your presence, but a greater clarity, hearing your voice like we've never heard it before. Clinging on, having a hunger for your word like, that, like we've never had before. Would you just light those things, the passion inside of us, would we light that, those things on fire, Lord, in us this week? Because you've created us to walk with you. You've created us, created us for relationship. And we want that relationship. And so we just thank you for it, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got our ministry team coming up right now that would love to pray for you for anything, any needs that you have. If you need a miracle in your body, if you love that story about the girl getting healed with the back, come up. We'd love to pray and stand in faith with you for God to do the same thing for you. You don't need a word of knowledge to get prayer. You just come up and ask because the Lord loves it when we ask. He loves to heal. I know some of you are here, and I feel like the Lord's highlighting, some of you are here uh, with a broken heart because of broken relationships in your life. You need to know that when Jesus first announced his ministry, he said, hey, I came to heal the brokenhearted. And that might be a work that God wants to do in you right now. It may not fix everything, but God wants to come in and bring healing to that 
broken part of, of your heart right now. So I encourage you to come forward and get prayed for. For the rest of you, man, we love you. So proud of you. So grateful to have you as part of our church family. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.